Okay, so here's a little bit of a tip for any round knife users out there. Um, if you think it's sharp enough, it probably not. You probably need to sharpen it more. If you're having trouble cutting through a piece of leather, sometimes you just gotta go over it a couple times. But it should mostly go through in one pass, even on skirting leather like this. Another thing to consider is your cutting board underneath. There's a lot of different materials. Uh, I like a high density polyethylene, HDPE. You can get LDPE, which is softer. And a tip of the knife tends to catch in it, which is really annoying because it'll give a bunch of resistance and all of a sudden it slips out and runs across your piece of leather. Uh, there's also polypropylene boards, which are pretty similar. They're cheaper. Uh, like I said, yeah, I wouldn't suggest cheaping out on your board if you're going to cut with a round knife. And the other thing is, when in doubt, drop your blade. That was the main body of the mug, and I've already got the base of the mug cut out of uh, this little spot down here. I cut it out of the belly because I want it to be a little bit stretchier. It actually works better if it's a little softer. And then we just need a spacer piece, which is going to be right here. Uh, let's go ahead and cut it this way, out of this chunk that's well, just going to be scrap anyhow. All right, now cutting these out. I will do as I normally do on cutting things out. I will punch some holes first that I can cut around. Might have to get the bigger melon out. There we go. And basically the same thing on the holes for this and for the other one that I'm doing. But it's all pretty simple. like usual make the cuts away from the holes doing one long cut and one short one Like I said, we'll do the same thing on these pieces, which I didn't mark them uh, when I was marking my pattern piece like I probably should have. Like I said, let's grab our bigger mallet. Or this bigger hole punch. Now let's talk about how to do the first steps of putting this together. So I need to rough this up and glue these together. Put this in between these two sides. So something like that and then I'm going to stitch it. Uh, 
So to do that, it's best to carbure wet this center so we can get a good fold on it. Like I said, we'll get to that. Now you can just use a knife or something to do this. I actually have a little rougher. It works okay on things this size. It's kind of more of a danger to my fingers than anything else if I try to use it on something smaller than this. Anyway, I almost forgot. Before I do this, I do want to do a little bit of edge beveling. Just right, right around this top, basically. There's probably going to be trimming on most everything else. But around that top, I want to have that edge beveled. This is one of the few times when I wet something down and I don't wet the whole thing down. But I'm going to be soaking the whole thing in a little bit um, to shape it after I've stitched it. But for right now, I only want to really wet the center part of it. And I'm kind of trying to just wet it from the back. Let it soak most of the way through. So as not to disturb too much of the grain surface. But looks like I'm going to have to anyway. Ah, then we can fold it back on itself a little bit. And get our spacer piece stuck in there. could probably be done without the glue but it's trickier um, if you're gonna sew this by hand you would more than likely want to punch holes in one side of this or mark at least where the holes are gonna be because this is three heavy layers of leather it's hard to punch holes all the way through it So my suggestion would be to punch holes through one of these where you want to stitch, then glue it all together, and come back and use a drill press um, to drill holes or a Dremel tool or um, you can even get a sewing machine needle or an awl blade and put it in a drill press and use that to just press it through rather than um, having the drill running and actually removing material. And that'll make a little bit cleaner holes. But it needs to be a sewing machine needle for a big leather stitching machine that can go through this much. So I just had to step away and ask my dog that question that no dog ever wants to hear. What's that in your mouth? And eh, she was chewing on one of these. We've got a no chewing on leather policy in the house, but she doesn't always pay attention to it. Now on these, I never really even tried to get them perfectly straight. Um, never can quite line it all up perfect, but I plan on trimming, trimming it a little bit later. Uh, and you can trim it all the way to when it's waxed and everything and all done. Because um, even waxed leather, even though it feels hard, it trims very well. Uh, so. so that's one mistake I have made making these quite a bit is getting too far over and slipping off my spacer piece and then now yeah, nothing quite lines up right but I've got a stitch line there and I can kind of just make up the rest as I go but let's mark our outside one too This is basically where you want to stitch it. Around the in 
inside of the handle and around the outside of that spacer. Okay, now I started off with a uh, especially plumbing fixture that I think was to adapt PVC to old iron pipes, uh, cast iron pipes. But anyway, I eventually made a uh, silicon mold so I could cast some resin versions of it. Just to make it easier because I could never find another piece like that. So if anybody's interested in the casting of exactly what I use, I might sell those on my Etsy store. Just like I said, let me know if you're interested. And since the dog's being noisy anyway, good time to do this. Just kind of knock it down until it's flat. Get a little bit of shaping into it. You can kind of see the shape that we're going to get. Like I said, we can play with that a little bit more if we really want. All right, and obviously these pieces of leather are totally soaked with water to make them do this. Otherwise, you couldn't drive it on that mold and let it fit like that and obviously it's darker so these have been like thrown in a sink and left to sit for a few minutes uh, the other side and what's gonna make the bottom of the mug I just use uh, a, a short chunk of three inch PVC pipe which is a little too small to fit into the actual base of this but remember we've got the piece of leather thickness all the way around so I just kind of mostly put it down in shape and then put a, um, a hose clamp on it, a large hose clamp. As you can see, it sticks out all the way around. But what's under the clamp is all we really need for our seam to sew it on. So all that I'm planning on trimming off anyway. We'll clamp it down nice and tight and then leave this overnight to dry. Well, probably going to leave it until this time tomorrow. And I usually do puff this out a little bit. Just adds a bit different shape to the bottom of the, the mug. Okay, I've left these several days to dry completely. They are back to being, I mean, you can still squish them and so on if you need to because they're still just thick leather. Uh, but to take these off the forms, I've already popped that one off. Uh, that's why I've got this piece of plastic pipe sitting out of here. Is so I can just take and kind of pound them out and push them off their forms. But anyway, then we've got our mug shape. And we've got our mug bottom shaped. So it should fit in there kind of nice and loose. And I'll go down and stitch that on with the machine. And what I'm going to do to do that is I'm going to leave a lot of extra thread hanging loose right here around this handle. Because I'm going to come back and I'm going to use that thread to put in a few extra stitches to really pull that good and tight by hand. But most of it I'm going to be able to just stitch around the edge with my machine. Now, again, if you're hand stitching, uh, it's not too much of a problem once you've got the holes in it. To go through like this but it is quite a bit to punch the holes through with an all all the way around i wouldn't try to punch the holes ahead of time um while it's all laying flat because when you go back to stitch this these holes are going to be a lot closer together than these holes out here because uh, you've got well three eighths half an inch of 
leather there that makes a difference in the uh, circumference of the circles. Okay, now the crockpot will be explained in a few minutes, but right now I need to finish up the stitching. As you can see, my machine can't quite get as close where I start to these edges as it can to when I finish it, but there's always going to be a gap here right at the handle, and you don't want to have the wax and lining or whatever try to fill that in. So you want to pull that as tight as possible. So I'm going to take, just using an awl and needles, I'm going to punch several holes along here until I actually will punch right through along with this last where that stitch is in the corner and kind of into the middle. And then the same way on this side I'm going to do just a couple stitches and into the middle. And hopefully I don't hit the same hole on the inside. That complicates things if I do. But let's get a couple needles out and an all and do this the old fashioned way. Now if someone hasn't taught you yet how to thread a needle, uh, these harness needles have little tiny eyes, so they're hard to thread, but they hold up better. But if you pinch that thread between your uh, thumb and forefinger all the way back, you can just poke it right on through that eye real easy. Pull it up, go back and pierce through your thread, and then pull that thread down till it straightens out, and that'll lock it on there. Don't tie any knots or anything like that. Anybody that tells you to tie a knot on there is just setting you up for failure because it makes it a lot harder to pull the stitches through. And I'm not marking my stitches at any particular length. I'm just going and punching them through. If you do these right, they will very nearly hold water even before you wax them and finish them up. Uh, and I'm actually going to, uh, I got one of them real close to this other hole here. I'm actually going to skip over that and go to this one with this thread. And the reason for that is, is because I don't want to have a thread just jumping back through here. You could technically probably come through here and just stitch all the way through that, but I kind of already have one down through here, so there'd have to be... It, it doesn't work out real well. So I just jump over that so it pulls down nice and tight. And then use that hole that I just skipped that goes up to the side for the other needle to get its way out there. So it's not really a normal stitch in that little spot. Pair of pliers here. Pull that through. So once you got it stitched there, now I'm just going to stitch over my other end that I've got back stitched a little bit. Do a couple extra stitches back and forth to lock it all in, and it'll be ready to just trim it up. Now, I've always trimmed these up with a knife. You can use a sander or something like that as well, but especially here on the bottom, I think it just works best to just get a good sharp knife and knock it off. Make sure it sits, you know, somewhat flat. Uh, now all these edges you can also use a knife on um, 
this is someplace that's probably easier to use a sander. And the cleaner and nicer, nicer you get these, the better it'll feel in the end. And after you've gone through with all the uh, trimming in the handle and around of it, I would say also take the edge beveler around the outside of this handle and any places, you know, just clean it all up, round the edges out nice. You can see my join here that I've got where it's all pulled together. You can still get a grip through that before it's lined. But see, that's closed up really nicely. That's what you're looking for when you do those hand stitches and pull it all in tight. Okay, really the only thing I did differently on these two was that on the black one, I went around, around the edges with some black dye. I didn't fill in the bottom. Just the edges. And even in the bottom of the cup, I didn't. I don't know if I'll get enough light in there to show you, but I didn't do any dyeing on the bottom at all in there. So it won't matter once it's covered up, but you could cut it out of the black leather too. Now you could also, I screwed up and I used white stitching as well as black stitching on this one. Oh, it's definitely a problem. And you could probably go over that with black dye and make it a little darker. Uh, but I don't know if I will on this one or not. Anyway, next step is the crock pot. And in this crock pot, I have about, I don't know, about five or six pounds of beeswax. Uh, there are a couple little scraps floating in there. It's about time to change this wax out. And I'm just going to do, uh, the next step is actually what gives these the name of jack mugs, is this is the step is jacking the leather. And that is basically stuffing it full of wax. And that's the actual term, is stuffing. Um, so this can be done a lot of different ways. You don't necessarily have to have a big puddle of wax like this. Uh, you do want to keep the leather moving around so that it doesn't have a chance to get too hot. And you can make a big mess doing this. Uh, but you could also do this in an oven by keeping the leather warm. Uh, you could go through and soak it in. And just kind of keep basting it with the wax. Uh, you could do the same thing with a heat gun. You could just keep basting it with wax and warming it with a heat gun. But I learned the hard way that you have to, if you're doing something like this with a crock pot, or even in an oven, that you have to move it around regularly. You can't let it sit in one spot because in an oven, the rack will actually get hotter than the oven and will transfer more heat into the leather and you'll wind up with wrinkly spots across your bottom. Uh, and in this, you'll wind up, if you don't turn it over regularly, you wind up getting one side too hot and it'll shrink and wrinkle up and cause trouble. So you need to keep turning this back and forth and moving it around some so you don't wind up with any hot spots on it. And you want enough wax to at least, you know, half of the mug in it. So, and that's pretty much all this step is, is several minutes of flipping it around until you don't have um, wax frozen to the surface. You'll have liquid wax coming off of it all the time. And I would also suggest having a tray to catch excess wax. I've got this rack sitting over top of this tray. It works really well for that. Um, and having a bunch of paper towels to get the wax, excess wax, off the outside of it. Um, they make great fire starters afterwards. If you want to start a charcoal grill, beeswax and paper towels works well. I guess I should mention some safety things about uh, wax while I'm doing this. Beeswax usually does not smoke unless there's contaminants in it until it catches fire. It just catches fire. Uh, you don't want to overheat beeswax. That's why I'm using a crock pot for this is because I can keep it at lower temperatures. You do not want to use open flame around beeswax. Same problem, catches on fire. So you have to be really careful not to catch the beeswax on fire. Um, you can use a double boiler if you're really um, persnickety about it and don't want to overheat it. But this is what we're looking for. We're looking for our whole thing to just have 
liquid wax just flowing off of it. And as this cools, it'll change to a bit different color of brown. Make sure we didn't deform it too much. And then we'll do the black one next. And after these have a chance to cool and harden back up, which will be, you know, half an hour or so, uh, then I'll go back and we'll, I'll be back and then we'll uh, line these. One of them I'm going to line with a more, somewhat more traditional method of wax and brewer's pitch. Uh, the really traditional was using um, the black pitch that had lamp black in it, but that's carcinogenic, so we don't want to use that. So we're just going to use brewer's pitch. It won't look the black that's traditional. Uh, the other one I'm going to line with a modern uh, epoxy resin. All right, now once these have mostly cooled, or even cooled all the way, there's enough wax in this leather that you can just go back and just burnish it like you would uh, any other piece. You don't have to put anything extra on it. The wax will do the job. And if it's too hard to do, too stiff, you can always warm it back up and it'll soften back up. But you can see this one, the bottom is real dark brown because that was undyed. Um, and this one, the whole thing is that dark brown and it's gone very stiff. It, it's actually, you can really put some force on it to not, uh, squish it. Feels like wood. But the next step will be lining these. Okay. While the, uh, the wax and rosin mixture uh, melts. I'm gonna start measuring out my pieces for my are my two parts for my epoxy, and we'll go ahead and do the black one. Uh, the dog is currently playing with toys, so there's gonna be some noise in the background of this. This stuff's pretty thick, so I've just got a little mark here on this. tiny measuring cup and this stuff is uh, two parts are uh, two equal parts one to one by volume so that's important some of them are by weight some of them are by volume some of them are one to two or one to whatever ratio so it's, it's important to know ahead of time what you're trying to be measuring out and which way you're supposed to measure it and I should probably mix this into one side or the other before mixing it together. But I'm going to add just a little bit of this um, black mica powder to make it look like the black pitch that was traditionally used. I'm not going to do that with my actual pitch mixture. I'm just going to leave that the yellow of the beeswax and brewer's pitch combination. And we're just going to pour that in and start sloshing it around. And I do just kind of roll it around in there. There's going to be a lot more of it that winds up down on the bottom of the mug when you're done. Oh, 
and you can use um, your sticks to kind of paint it up to that edge if you want. But I'll pretty much just roll it around for most of the work time of the resin, which in this case is only a few minutes. Let me go ahead and pour out some of my excess here. Not all of it though, because you want some to settle into all the cracks and crevices down in the bottom of the mug because that's your most likely place to get a leak is either right here where you, uh, your handle comes on or just in these stitching holes around the bottom. So you want it to kind of fill all that up and make it solid. Alright, now I just heat this um, mixture. It's half and half beeswax and uh, pine rosin. Uh, sometimes it's called brewer's pitch. I've heard it called rock rosin. It's, it's basically just uh, pine sap. Uh, but yeah, I heat this up in a pot of boiling water till it's melted. And I just put that in the cup and roll it around. And as it comes into contact with the leather that is now cool, it'll make a layer on the leather of beeswax and resin. Then pour the excess back into the pot. Let some flow down into the bottom. Because again, sealing down here at the bottom is your most important part. And one of the nice things about using the traditional wheat beeswax and pitch finish is if it does spring a leak down in one of these corners or something, uh, you can just take a long lighter, one of the barbecue lighters, you know, Aim and Flame is a brand of them, um, and just kind of warm that up down there and then smoosh it together and seal it up yourself. A uh, long match or something like that would work too. Pepper. <laughs>